Tonight it's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce Mohamed Farmi, who's going to speak tonight uh, under the title Time and Tragic Optimism. Mohamed uh, was, is the former English bureau chief of Al Jazeera, the Egypt office, and is currently a Green College journalist in residence and an adjunct professor jointly appointed in the School of Journalism and the W. Morris Young Center for Applied Ethics here at UBC. Mr. Fahmy is an award-winning journalist and author. In 2011, he received a Peabody Award for his coverage of the, Av of the Arab Spring and the Tom Renner Investigative Reporting Award for producing the documentary Death in the Desert. Earlier this year, he founded the Farmy Foundation for Free Press to help journalists imprisoned worldwide. In 2014, he received the Canadian Commission World Press Freedom Award and a certificate from UNESCO. Mohammed is going to speak for 45 minutes or so. We'll have 30 minutes for discussion and questions and then we invite you all to join us in a reception in the building across the way in Graham House. Please uh, welcome Mohammed Fahmy. Thank you all for having me here and my wife. We're, uh, we feel like we, it's a rebirth for us being back here in uh, Vancouver and University of British Columbia specifically. Um, we have spent almost two years of uh, an, an emotional roller coaster, to say the least, and I've labeled it before as a horrific nightmare that doesn't want to end, and I've called it a circus, labeling the trial that we've been through, and many other uh, labels that are very dark. But I'm very glad that I'm here. I'm a free man. Um, I do believe that part of the reason why I'm standing here today is the, um, the constant petitions that were signed, the tweets, the, the support I've received from uh, people across the globe that had no idea who I am, but they understood what the meaning of freedom of expression is, and the, that the free press is part of any true democratic society and part of the oxygen we breathe, basically, to be able to express ourselves and be able to um, listen to various thoughts and people from across the globe um, and that's what we journalists stand for. We are messengers and sometimes journalists do steer away and they take on this role of agents of democratic change but I believe that I've lived throughout my 17 year old career uh, with a balanced way of looking at uh, the events that I covered. And just a quick um, tour or, or explanation of where, where, why I, I came to Canada originally. I came in the early 90s with my family, it's like millions of immigrants looking for true democracy, freedom of speech, civil liberties that are usually what millions of people back uh, in the Middle East are hungry for. And we, I lived here and I studied here in uh, Montreal and in Vancouver and did some odd jobs before I decided to uh, begin my uh, career in Iraq in 2003 on the first day of the war um, with the Los Angeles Times and it was a very intense one year uh, job um, and, for, and I always tell all journalists and students that I speak to that um, every single job you do throughout your career be it a translator, an interpreter, a researcher leading to that um, where you want to be really counts and it's you sh that they should take it very seriously because all the journalists you meet on the way it's one small community believe it or not and you'll keep they keep you keep bumping into everybody you've worked with and having that integrity from day one on the job really means a lot in the future and in my case it surfaced again when I was detained and all these journalists I've worked with came together in a unified message to all the leaders in the world and of course the Egyptian president um, in unprecedented uh, unity when CNN and BBC and Al Jazeera and ITN all these big networks are together on one screen on one day on one specific hour saying the same message there were um, leaders in the media like Christiana Manpour whom I've worked with before during my time in CNN with you know, raising that free AJ staff campaign and we've, I don't think any social media campaign has um, uh, brought so much attention to this cause of free speech uh, like the free AJ staff 
campaign did with 141 million participants and uh, over 700 impressions in one month. Um, so the social media has definitely played a role also in my, towards my freedom. It kept the, my plight alive and I did feel it, snippets of it was, um, I could feel it in my prison cell. Um, my wife and my family used to, in that 45 minutes, we would cram as much as we can and they would tell me, hey, you know, they're fighting for you in Canada, there's a protest for you here, there's 50,000 Canadians have signed the Avas petition. And then this is what actually gave me power behind bars when I was sitting in a cell sleeping on the floor for one month in solitary confinement with no access to sunlight or any way of telling time and I had a broken shoulder at the time as well and there were too many insects, I would kill 50, 60 mosquitoes and a hundred more would come in and it was a really tough one month in that prison cell in the Scorpion uh, maximum security prison and I'm a journalist but my neighbors in that wing are Al-Qaeda members and ISIS fighters and people who have no respect to democracy or anything we live for or free speech. So knowing that all this was happening outside kept me going and it raised my morale and it gave me power. And I, I, I think a lot of you wonder how you yourself would have handled 438 days in a prison like that. Um, I think we don't realize how powerful we are until we test our limits. Um, you know, us journalists, we, we, we do face uh, these um, challenges on the front line, but this one was a little bit more different. I couldn't pack my gear and leave. I had to stay there and I had to figure out how to survive. And I think the way I survived is by keeping a balance between my mental, spiritual and physical side, trying to do anything to keep me going um, throughout the day. And it's a very long day inside that cell. Um, to, to, to just explain why this whole case happened, um, I do feel I'm a stronger man now than I was when I entered, uh, when I was arrested on December 29, 2013 with my colleagues Peter Greste and Bahar Mohammed, and we were charged with conspiring with the Muslim Brotherhood group who were designated as terrorists and fabricating news to serve their agenda. Um, which is to smear Egypt and make it look like there's a civil war when there wasn't, and operating without proper licenses. Of course, these are all laughable <laughs> accusations. And the, the three of us were recognized journalists that had a career with, you know, nobody has ever accused us of even, you know, anything. So it was very tough, and um, ironically, the network I worked for, I was the bureau chief for four months before I got arrested, a bit less than four months. Um, and Al Jazeera has a very um, you know, image, the image in Egypt wasn't the best image. Uh, in fact, it was vilified by the Egyptian government. Um, I made a differentiation between the Arabic and the English networks, and I made it very clear when I took the job to all my bosses that please separate me from the Arabic, let me do my own news gathering, sourcing, booking, and research. And they accepted that condition. Um, the Arabic uh, network ded uh, dedicated to coverage of Egypt had been shut down by a court order. Um, so I took on the job. A lot of people, even family members, were wondering why are you doing that? You know that the network is questionable. I said, well, you know, I, some of the best journalists, friends of mine, are working in the English Channel, and I believe that they're different, and I'm doing my job accordingly, with integrity, and this is what I do, you know, this is, this is what we journalists do, and I've made my point clear about separating myself. So the last story I reported was on December 24, 2013. I went on air at 1.30 a.m. for half an hour with the phone, and I reported a car bomb. And Usually after you, you, you analyze, you record the data, how many people were killed, and you get the information from your stringers, then you, did, you, 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 you pitch or report a little bit of analytical analysis um, to what's happening. And at night, just before I went to sleep, there was a banner on Egyptian TV that said the Muslim Brotherhood have been designated as a terrorist group. 
Now that came as a surprise because the Muslim Brotherhood have been um, the first democratically elected government in Egypt. They are a group that was formed in 1928 and they had been um, at struggles throughout history with the Egyptian government. During Sadat, uh, he banned them, uh, Abdel Nasser placed them in prison and also banned them and they were operating uh, most of their <clears throat> history was the operation was underground, secret operation. But with Mubarak, he gave them more uh, flexibility to operate as a, a group. And then after the January 25 revolution in Egypt, uh, which took, started on Jan 25, and Mubarak stepped down after 18 days, and as Egyptians and Canadians and Americans, the whole world was hopeful that Egypt is now on a new path, that there is a chance that we might see changes and more flexibility and more democratic um, society. And a lot of my friends flew in from the States, filmmakers, writers, musicians, everybody was in Tahrir Square making songs. And it was such a beautiful uh, feeling. And as journalists, we were also um, enjoying this very powerful story and it was the Arab Spring and it was labeled as the Arab Spring. Um, at the time people were saying that it's the revolution and the Facebook and Twitter revolution. Of course Facebook and Twitter revolution helped a lot in bringing these grassroots protests and people together but I, I think it was a bit of an exaggeration labeling it that way because Mubarak had shut down the internet for four days for, uh, on the fourth day of the revolution, for probably a day and a half. And again, I could see everybody using the old-fashioned way, the posters and congregating and at a certain cafe and meeting points. And, you know, and again, the protests continued and, the, you know, and it, you know, the social media helped, but it wasn't a Facebook, Twitter revolution. So sometimes the media gets a bit carried away. But anyway. <laughs> um, so... For me, the, my journey was from Tahrir Square. Um, I worked with CNN for three years. I went, to, you know, covered the Arab Spring in Libya and Syria and Egypt, and um, it was like all journalists. We were working almost seven days a week and nonstop. And a journalist's job never ends. I mean, first of all, I tell journalists: if you're ever into this job for money, you're in the wrong business. You know, this is <laughs> this is a job that requires working on the field and going home and factoring in everything you've done and being able to write, edit, talk, speak on air and you're working in your sleep basically and you're preparing for the next day and in, in, a, in, a, in a very volatile situation like that a bomb goes off at three in the morning or something is always happening so it was challenging times. Um, <clears throat> I took a break from journalism for two and a half months and I joined my wife not too many times, just twice, on, on the street in a protest, and took the journalism cap off, and I, was, and I chanted in a subtle way on the side. You know, journalists are not supposed to get too excited like that, but, you know. Um, and I chanted calling for early elections. I wanted the Muslim Brotherhood gone. I didn't, I didn't like the way they were running the country, like millions of other people, and I, I was hoping that they, we would see new elections. Um, apparently the situation got very complicated and it became, it got really tense and on June 30th millions of people took to the streets in Egypt and finally uh, the Muslim Brotherhood were ousted and that came with serious violence after that. There were dozens of churches that were burned, there were many casualties. Um, they had staged a sit-in called the Rab al uh protest. Thousands, tens of thousands of Muslim Brotherhood supporters, sympathizers were there against the ousting of their leader and their, um, the Muslim Brotherhood. I only went once. I took a look at it and I realized this, this is not going to end well. You know, the, it, it seemed it was very organized and like the Muslim Brotherhood, they, they were very organized. They were the most organized group. The, the youth the secular youth who started the revolution in, in, two, in January 25 um, weren't that organized. 
They were young, they were unexperienced, but the Muslim Brotherhood were really good at organizing themselves, at supporting the groups. I had covered stories of them in the slums sometimes and in the poor areas where they were, they knew how to provide charity and congregate, get people together and they had information of who to call and they were providing ch um, blankets and, and school um, uh, material for the, for the children. So they were the most organized group. They went in and they, they won. So now that they're gone, um, <clears throat> it turned really ugly. About a thousand questionable figures, of course. Close, some say 600, some say 1,000. Uh, of their followers were killed in the dispersal of the Rabah Adawiyah. And it was compared to the Tiananmen Square of what happened in China in the 80s. Uh, I joined Al Jazeera English. Um, and my wife, you know, my wife took the decision that I should do it as long as I make that differentiation. And I trusted my network. I asked them, are we legal here? Because usually we're, I was, we, they set shop in the Marriott Hotel. I mean, I've worked from hotels with many networks and we'd cover an event for three days to get a good position of the protest, or, but we would pack up and leave. But Al Jazeera English had set up a, an office there when I came. So I asked them, are we legal? They said, yes, we're legal. Just concentrate on your editorial work and leave the legalities for us. So I trusted them, like anyone should trust his reputable company and you know, continued working. So excuse me if I'm jumping back and forth, but I'm just trying to simplify the story, a very complicated story. Um, so December 20, I'm reporting that the Muslim Brotherhood is a, designated as a terrorist group. Four days later, I get a knock on my door, and it's very dramatic. I look, and there's a waiter, the old waiter trick. He's holding a tray. You know. So I open the door, and suddenly I see a dozen cops barging in, and one of them is he's, he's filming the raid, and the other guy's taking photos. And you know they're searching the place, and they're treating me like I'm a criminal, and they're questioning me, and it's, I've asked them, who are you guys? No, no Miranda rights, no Charter of Rights in Canada. I mean, I have no idea who these people are. They could, you know, and so they broadcast the video on television. And before I even received, arrived at the police station, I was branded as a terrorist. And they arrested my colleague Peter and Beher from his home, and we were sent to the state prosecution, and we were shocked at the accusations. You know, what do you mean I'm a member of the Muslim Brotherhood? First of all, I protested against them. Second of all, I'm a journalist, and you don't have no evidence. Why are you even having this conversation? So going back to Scorpion Prison, to survive, as I mentioned, of course you have to maintain your being inside. But we also did what journalists do. We started interviewing everybody inside. I mean, you have exclusive material for life. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have, I have lost friends, and I have almost died a couple of times trying to get so close to these um, you know, extremists to try to figure out what goes on in their minds. Um, so we started a mock radio show inside. Every day at 8 o'clock, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in the solitary confinement cell, there's a hatch in the door, in this very thick metal door. It's about 7 by 3 centimeters. So all I could see, if I look at the other um, cell in the corridor, is the eyes and some of the face of the other prisoner. And so every day at 8, I would call everybody to the hatch and say, good evening, everyone. We're having the Al Jazeera uh, live radio show from Scorpion Prison live today. Uh, we will interview the head of the Muslim Brotherhood today. Hello, sir. Can you please tell us why you did so on that day and what happened and why did you agree to that or to this or that? You know, and, it was interesting because you have the extremists who, some of them were with bin Laden in the caves in Tora Bora. They were ISIS sympathizers and fighters who just came in from Syria and they want to topple the Egyptian regime. And all they want to talk about all day is bomb making skills and how, many, how much TNT you got to put in the bomb. And it was, it was really a very surreal um, image or scene. And that show was like our lifeline inside. To me and my colleagues, we would prepare for it like a real TV show all day. I'd be saying, I'm going to ask this guy about 
what he did when he visited Obama in the States. And he would tell me, and he would really, they would, they would talk like politicians still, and they still use their official titles, because I had the presidential team with me inside, and minister, the minister of interior, the minister of uh, transportation. <laughs> you know, and it, it was like a, a, a George Orwell all over again, you know, and a constant struggle of ideologies. And sometimes it would turn really ugly inside and screaming and yelling. And I would have to interject because the, they really thought they were, the head of the parliament was there. And, you know, I would tell him, sir, thank you very much. But, you know, can we just move on? You know, and it, it was really like managing these people was very tough. It was one of the toughest shows I've ever done. <laughs> but the worst day in relation to the show was when the warden came up to me and pulled me very aggressively out of bed. He, he literally like, pulled me out of bed. He said, get out! I'm like, what's going on? I didn't even wash my face. I don't know what's going on. He's like, this show has to stop. You are destroying my prison. I don't like this. I'm like, sir, we're just talking about stuff that you already know. We're not talking about the nuclear bomb and the secrets of the CIA or, you know, he's like, it's got it's to stop. I was like, okay, fine. So we were silenced again in prison and took, taken off the air again you know so I it was a tough experience we went to court the evidence in court was laughable we all the, the, the press corp in Egypt there we've known them all, all our lives New York Times the CNN crews and you know they it was a very tough story to cover because this is your friend inside and you still have to have objectivity and you know, and we would have these mini press conferences that, from the cage, and it's a very degrading cage. And I would, I, I have a loud voice, and sometimes the police would not allow the journalists to come close and let them stay. So I would yell across the room, and you're seeing your mother and your wife, and seeing them tearing, and it's tough. And you gotta look tough so they don't break down. And people don't realize how much pain the family goes through because. They go home, they don't know what's happening to you inside, but they hear stories about prisoners dying in prison, and uh, the conditions were horrific. I mean, I did see people dying. And so, again, the court, the evidence was flimsy. They had nothing to prove that we had contacts with the Muslim Brotherhood. They had nothing to prove about fabrication, to the extent that the video committee um, appointed by the judge looked at our videos and told him, there's no fabrication here. So why are we even here? So let's uh, ask the judge, show me what evidence you have. He, he brought a photo of me and former President Morsi in the palace. I'm like, sir, thank you very much. This is called an exclusive. <laughs> I'd do it again any day. You know, um, thank you for showing off my work. And I, I, actually, I actually tried to break the ice with the judge. He was a very scary looking judge. He looks like one of those mafia Guys, we had uh, sunglasses throughout the trial. Can you imagine a judge with sunglasses throughout the whole trial, most of the trial? So one day I told him, sir, um, you know, have you seen, there is beer and beer on my Marriott bill. Have you ever seen a terrorist that drinks beer and, and whiskey? And he said, he laughed, he grinned, you know, and, you know, and on World Press Freedom Day, for example, the award you were tell, talking about, that came in the best time because... Ironically, I was in court on World Press Freedom Day on May 3rd, 2014, in the cage. So I asked the judge again to let me get out. So he asked him, sir, the whole world is watching you. Can you please let us out on bail? The Egyptian constitution says you are uh, innocent until proven, proven guilty. So why am I with Muhammad al-Zawahri sharing a wing? Why am I sleeping on the floor? And he said, he laughed. He's like, go back to your cage. Happy press, press Freedom Day. You know, so it was a tough trial. I was sentenced to seven years. Um, in the video, I'm clinging on the bars and like seven officers pulling me back because I couldn't believe it. I had even smuggled out with my wife, who was my lifeline, uh, a celebratory um, statement. And my wife would, sm every visit, which is once a week, she would bring me all Pizza Hut and the food and Pepsi and milk, stuff that I have to like really ration throughout my time. And no fridge, of course, so you, know, you have to improvise and, uh, or share it or eat it all quickly. <laughs> so she would smuggle printouts of UBC statement saying that they're behind me and that they are, you know, they're going to hire me. Um, statements from that, that and, and even photos of 
uh, rallies across the world and days of action and photos of people who have tape on their mouth and this humongous global campaign. And I would, she would hide them in the trays under the fish or the rice. And as soon as I got back into the cell, I'd just get away, all, move all the food and just read what's happening. It was more important for me than the food. The news was more important for me than the food. So it was a struggle. We were finally released the, um, from prison on bail. Spent six months. And, and the appeals court stated, it was on January 21st, 2015, first day of the year, and the judge said there's lack of evidence. In any civilized court, they would send you home. But they kept us in prison and said, retrial. And in the first case of the retrial, they sent us out on bail, banned me from traveling, and we went through six months of an excruciating trial retrial with the same evidence, the same accusations, doesn't make sense to me. So, I'll, and I'm, I'll be speaking more on the legal aspects as I go, but, so President Sisi initiated this new law, uh, the presidential decree for deportation of foreign citizens to their countries, if it's for the interest of the country. My colleague, Peter Greste, um, was benefited from this law and he was sent back to Australia a year before I was, and he was freed. And this is when my rhetoric towards our government's stance took a bit of a turn. I refused in the beginning to believe when I was told in my cell that our government wasn't putting enough clout, they, didn't, they were not really out there. So, I mean, the Canadian uh, ambassadors, they were amazing, and the consular team, they'd come, they'd visit me, they'd check on me, make sure I'm not tortured, they'd bring me newspapers and books, maple syrup, you know, I had no pancakes, so I was drinking <laughs> sugar rush. <laughs> but um, they were doing great, but I did feel, I joined the international chorus when I was released and started searching in it of how I felt that the government was not um, stepping up to the urgency of the situation. And we started the Harper Call Egypt hashtag campaign, again, through social media. Um, I did believe in the beginning that bullhorn diplomacy was not the way to go because the Egyptian government is very sensitive to in what they call international meddling into internal affairs. And Mr. Baird, I agreed, and I was telling the embassy, yeah, okay, let's just, you know, let's just do it in a different way. Then when this deportation decree surfaced and my uh, colleague was deported, this is when we wanted, like, the real muscle in, the, you know, the aggressive statements of, uh, condemnation. And at that time, Mr. Baird came to Egypt. He met with my wife and my mom, and uh, he played. There was you know, Canada is very good friends with Egypt, other than the, um, that they're on the same political views on many geopolitical aspects. They also pledged $60 million of our taxpayers' money to Egypt in aid every year, and they $5 million for other uh, business, small business projects, and they're training the Egyptian police. So I was hoping that, you know, he would nudge the Egyptian president and tell him, get this guy out. And the, 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 the weird part is that we were told, I'm coming back home. Mr. Baird went and he said, this release is imminent. And my wife quit her job. My mom sent me four bags of clothes that I didn't need, you know, winter clothes. And, she, you know, and I shaved and I'm all prepared. I'm going to go home. And suddenly, a U-turn happened. I was thrown back into the, into the case, and Peter was deported, and we have no questions why that happened. Yeah, until today, even, you know, we try to get questions, I, we try to meet with officials, our lawyers. So my lawyer, Amal Clooney, uh, stepped in. She had, she had joined in uh, during the appeal phase, and she brought um, a whole new aspect to the whole story. She, first of all, she... Um, she's one of the best human rights lawyers. Uh, she handled Julian Assange for uh, WikiLeaks. She handled other world leaders. And so she wrote part of the annex to the appeal that obligated, highlighted Egypt's obligations towards international treaties and uh, due process. But she also was lobbying where Al Jazeera wasn't lobbying. Uh, she was lobbying with Egyptian ambassadors in Washington and Ottawa. She was speaking to the Egyptian government in Egypt. Um, and she was, she did a great job. 
But she also offered to come and meet Mr. Baird and Mr. Harper in Canada and offer them free advice about this new deportation law. And nobody knew what this deportation law was about. Not even the Australians, not even the Egyptians. It's never been uh, applied before. And they refused to meet her in Ottawa. So that was a shock for us. And you could see it in her uh, statements. And I'm always thankful to the efforts of Ottawa. Um, however, I do believe much more could have been done. And, I'd, and I say this in a constructive manner because today I was just in Ottawa uh, two days ago and I am working with Amnesty International at the moment in preparing a charter of recommendations to how to better protect Canadian citizens abroad. And that includes, uh, part of it is leader to leader intervention as soon as the arrest happens. Because of the Middle East now is so complicated and political turmoil and all these security apparatuses are you know, fighting each other, even within the country. Um, that leader-to-leader -leader intervention could help because as soon as you are arrested, that window between the arrest and before the case goes to court, that is the best time for the president to intervene and deport you before it becomes in the hands of the judiciary and becomes really complicated in this, in this clogged judicial system. And in Egypt, the judicial system is your worst nightmare because they are out there. It's almost like the McCarthyism of the 60s that I only read about. Some of you may have witnessed it, where they are eradicating the books, the ideology, the thoughts, you name it. Anything MB related, MB is the abbreviation, Muslim Brotherhood, you're gone. And that's where I was. I was placed as a terrorist with the Muslim Brotherhood. And even if it doesn't work, the leader-to-leader -leader intervention could mean that you get a bed instead of sleeping on the floor, you get an extra hour of sun, extra food, extra family visit, and this stuff really counts for something when you are clinging on hope. Um, so that charter is very important for me. We will present it, hopefully soon, uh, as a beginning, and then hopefully in the future we try, when Ottawa's government is um, open, to our suggestions, we will try to get it hopefully into policy change. May work, may not, but we will try to build on this new era of change we have here in the country and hope that Mr. Trudeau uh, will respond to it. I did meet with him for an hour before the elections when I arrived and I did meet with Mr. Mulcair and I expressed that I, I'm a journalist, I'm not endorsing anyone, but I am thankful to them because they were in contact with my mom, with my lawyers, with my family and Mr. Marc Garneau and Mr. Paul Dewar did a lot of work. They were, you know, they all wanted to help and they all questioned Mr. Harper in Parliament just asking him to uh, take a more aggressive approach. So this charter is very important to me because any Canadian tomorrow morning, whether you're a doctor, a pilot, a teacher, you can be in a similar situation. And not just in Egypt. I've worked and lived in the Middle East for, since I left Canada. I've been back for vacations to get a breather in, in a civilized <laughs> place where there is more um, freedoms and to try to stay away from the politics. Um, but there are many issues in, in the Middle East that needs to be addressed and we need to be prepared if this happens to anyone. And knowing your government is behind you is important, to be honest. Um, and I don't think it's got anything to do with race. Some people disagree. I don't think it's, it has to do with uh, being a Mohammed or John. I think the government just didn't understand the urgency of the geopolitical case. Because this case, at the end of the day, is not just about suppression of the press. It's also a political score-settling vendetta, deep one, that doesn't get play in the media much because, understandably, the, our case happened when ISIS was rising and the conflict in, in, um, in Russia and uh, Ukraine and the two Malaysian airlines that crashed. So it, the, the context was not highlighted in the coverage. Egypt and Qatar are really at, in serious battles, um, and I'll, I'll explain very briefly why. Uh, Qatar had uh, supported, it's not a secret, Qatar had supported the Muslim Brotherhood until they came to power and continue to do so. Politically, financially, Qatar has pledged the Morsi government $10 billion during when they were running the country. And as soon as they were ousted, they took back the money. Um, but who came in? Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Kuwait, and they pledged $12 billion 
to do that. And then these coalitions arise. And this is another issue now in the, in the Middle East, that there are, we have coalitions with different uh, views of the whole uh, uh, strategic um, uh, arena. You have Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Egypt, on one hand, consider the Muslim Brotherhood as terrorists, and Bahrain. Kuwait is sort of meddling in and trying to play the, the mediator. And you have Turkey and Qatar, uh, Turkey and Qatar, yes, on the other hand, who consider the Muslim Brotherhood as moderates, and they did not designate them as terrorists. So how do you deal with the situation every time? And it's different also on the ground in Syria, for example. You have different countries who consider different groups as moderates or extremists, Qatar considers Jabhat al-Nusra as rebels. Jabhat al-Nusra, for example, is um, an offshoot of al-Qaeda. And it's been labeled as a terrorist group by the UN, by the US, by um, the UK and Canada. But Qatar considers them rebels. So it's, a bit, it's very complicated. Um, and it goes back to roots in 2003 when I was there in Iraq and I... You know, I, I went in on the first day of the war, and I was democracy, and let's get rid of Saddam, and it was a good cause. But some, what I saw in, implementing, in implementation, that was really questionable. Um, and one of the points I believe contributed to the rise of ISIS is the way the Iraqi army was disbanded. So overnight, 400,000 soldiers are told to go home. You have no job. Some of them joined... Uh, Al Zarqawi back then, who was uh, leading Al Qaeda in, uh, in Iraq, and then they sort of gradually evolved into this ISIS group that is, you know, they, 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 they change the meaning of different words in the Quran and try to interpret it in a different way that suits their pervert. You know, it's a very, it's a very sick way, the way they look at things. And uh, I could see it in prison in their conversations with me. And, you know, and uh, it, it's something that we have to we have to realize we're at war with these people, and and they are really good at using social media. And I've seen a lot of them in prison who are they look like some of us. I mean, they're wearing sweaters and they speak perfect English, and so, some of them even smoke cigarettes. And I ask them, why are you smoking? He's like, yeah, no, 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 we do it uh, just to fit in. I was like, okay. <laughs> Because there's a lot of super, it's, it's, it's very superficial at times in the Middle East. For example, I would, my wife was the only woman in the, in the, in the, visit, in the visit room um, that wasn't veiled. All the other women that are visiting their husbands or sons, they're veiled. And so I would, you know, that you're in a superficial world, what are you going to do? I would tell the officer, he would come up to me and say, how come your wife is not, uh, and your mother, they're not veiled? Aren't you a Muslim brother? I'm like, yeah, well, this is my alibi. There you go. <laughs> you know, it's very simple. And none of, nobody, very little, none of them smoke. So that's why I asked them why they consider smoking as illegal or, you know, uh, you know against Islamic beliefs. And so they say, no, we do that so we can fit in. In the, in the civilization and blend in and be able to operate. I mean, okay, great. I'm going to live with these people for a year. <laughs> you know, it's, and humor is important in prison. And humor is important on the front lines. When you're covering a war and you're waiting on a border for 10 hours for the story to happen, then it, it does, it's never humorous what happens after that. But it's, um, it's important, to, again, to, to survive. But reading books helped a lot. Uh, in the beginning, we weren't allowed any reading material. Gradually, they allowed us one newspaper. Then uh, gradually, you have small victories in prison. You know, you start convincing the guards and the wardens that you're not so bad. You know, that, you know, what, what journalism means. And you try to get victory half an hour out in the sun. And finally, we're allowed books. And that was another world for me. I mean, that was, you know, my, I read Mande Mandela's book, The Road to Freedom. And when you read it in prison, it's very different when you read it in the park. <laughs> Everything resonates, you know, you're like, whoa, this is unbelievable. This, he's so right. <laughs> but the book that really changed my whole perspective, and this is what I called today um, my modest talk here, uh, Tragic Optimism. And this is a book... Uh, Man's Search for Meaning, written, written by Mr. Viktor Frankl, a survivor of the Holocaust and uh, 
Oh boy, I mean, he describes his Auschwitz experience and after reading that in prison, I felt pretty good where I was, to be honest. And it really resonated with me and because his concept basically talks about saying yes when you're facing injustice and death and pain and how to deal with it and how to accept that now this is your world and you have to live with it. How to say, if you understand why, you're going to be able to figure out the how. And this is what really inspired me in prison. I probably read the, books twi the book twice in prison. And um, I live with this motto today in everything I do, from the time I wake up in the morning. How do I turn suffering into a self-achievement? And I think it's probably the reason why I survived knowing you know, I'm living with a, with a permanent disability in my arm. I can't do my job the same way I do it in terms of using the camera, but I will go back to journalism, of course, after I decompress and gather myself and give back. And by doing that, it helps me a lot as well. Um, I started the Family Foundation. I registered while I was in prison with my lawyers and my wife, and we set it up in Vancouver. And uh, what we do basically is, uh, what I did for the past two years, is support journalists imprisoned behind, in jail across the glo globe uh, financially. Um, I got donations and a crowdfunding campaign helped me pay fees. I mean, most of the lawyers in the case took huge, um, um, they waived a lot of their uh, fees including Amal, I mean, Amal waived her fees, but there was like 30 grand here for the team, you know, lawyers are expensive. The team and the research team and stuff, you know. So we raised that money when I was in prison through crowdfunding. Um, and some, those who donated really helped me. I mean, the fan mail was great. I mean, the support mail, I mean, and it, was, and it gave me goosebumps reading these letters. Uh, so now this is what we do. We just donated $3,000 to Wupshit Tay. He's an Ethiopian journalist um, serving 10 years again for fabricated terrorism charges. He's an excellent journalist that won a CNN award. He's now languishing in a prison cell and to further punish him, they put him in a real pr a prison really far so his family can't visit him easily. Uh, we advocate for them using social media and the contacts that I have that I've had in the Middle East for quite a while and now with this um, attention that I'm getting, I'm able to work with Amnesty and Committee to Protect Journalists and other organizations. And I, the NGOs really uh, do a really good job. That watchdog approach and keeping governments accountable and you know, putting the news out there as soon as it happens and they depend on social media as well. And it's a very close network where they share information. I think these NGOs um, are again, a lifeline to not just prisoners, to refugees and the families of the missing. And, um, and I, you know, I, 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 I've never seen a clampdown on freedom of expression and human rights the way I'm seeing it happen now. It's probably the worst in a generation. Um, you know, at the moment, in 2015, according to CPJ, Committee to Protect Journalists, 45 journalists have been killed in 2015 alone, and 200 remain behind bars. According to uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon from the United Nations, the Secretary General, 700 journalists have been killed in the past decade. In prison as well, um, I learned of the, the slaying of Stephen Sotloff. American young journalist who was killed by ISIS. And I asked my wife to tweet for me from prison, a tweet. And I said, his slaying is not going in vain because it's, it has started a revolution against ISIS. And indeed, a couple of days later, the coalition started bombing ISIS. But what really, you know, really hurt me about, uh, about uh, Sotlov, one, he had visited me and my wife at home in Cairo before going to uh, Syria. And he wanted to borrow my flag jacket. I couldn't give it to him because CNN, uh, CNN owned it. But I started, he, he was no cowboy. He was a lot, like a lot of good young journalists, freelancers, who want to go in and genuinely help people. 
and show their, their plight and focus. And in Syria, that's one of the worst human um, uh, crises at the moment. With five million refugees, this Syrians displaced internally and externally out of uh, Syria. And we're seeing the issue of the migration now. Um, so he died, and I could see prisoners celebrating. <laughs> That was, that, was, that was bad, because they're celebrating uh, the slaying of a, a good human being. And again, it was repeated with Charlie Hebdo when I was inside in France, the killing of uh, artists who are using satire <laughs> to portray the, their, their feelings. Um, again, with Corporal Nathan here in Ottawa, and I went with my, my wife and we visited um, the war memorial just the other day, uh, all these issues were really, um, you know, in, like, in front of my eyes, and I could see how they were celebrating these issues. But again, countries now across the world are really panicking about the wave of terrorism. And it's true that this is an unprecedented wave of terrorism, and we need unprecedented ways of fighting it. But that doesn't mean that we clamp down on, on our hard-earned civil liberties. And for any democratic government, I believe, there should be a balance between security and maintaining civil liberties. Or else you lose that and they win. And I could see them celebrating laws like the Qatari cybercrime law, or the Egyptian terrorism law, or the C-51, or the C-24. All these laws are, you know, they, they are uh, victories for them. <laughs> of course we have to fight them, but we cannot sacrifice what we stand for. And that's, and, and, and I, try, I was writing about this stuff from prison, and I started writing op-eds and smuggling it with Marwa, and I didn't care if the government would be angry at me if they found it out in the media. And, but they had realized, the government in Egypt, that this guy and these guys inside are, they're a big deal because of the support we got from you. You know, when they realized, because the Canadian media did a superb job, and that's translated in what happens to me when I go out in the street now. People coming up to me and saying hello, they recognize me, they recognize Marwa, and they say hello. But, but again, the Canadian media has never been translated into the Egyptian press and Middle Eastern press the same way it happened this time. And the, the headlines were being translated in Egypt, and that again, protected us, because the government knew that our plight is being covered. Unfortunately, uh, after the six months, I was sent to prison, sentenced again for three years. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I was standing in that cage, and I, you know, I, I, had told, I told Mara, I'll be back in five minutes, and I hugged her, and I told Amal, just give me two minutes, I'll be back. And I went in the cage with my phone and my wallet, <laughs> and one, thinking I'm going home. So when the judge th said that, it felt like Mike Tyson just gave me a punch. You know, and I had to go through the whole um, uh, scenario again, take off my suit, get into that prison garb, and go in again, and losing your freedom, and not able, you're controlled by an illiterate officer who has no idea what you stand for, or journalism, or anything that matters to us. Um, so finally, the Egyptian president pardoned us. I think it was a, due to all these factors together. The armies of diplomats coming together, the NGOs, um, the social media support, the grassroots support. And this is what I promote in my foundation, that the awareness helps. But it has to be accompanied by a parallel strategy where you're having a social media campaign, good lawyers who know what they're doing, and um, uh, public relations, and your family needs to be there because once you humanize the story, people hear, oh, he's a terrorist, oh, Al Jazeera, it starts with Al or something, what, what's that, what's going on? I mean, uh, you know, but then you start humanizing the story, and they see your mother talking and your wife, and they see, well, you know, there's a, this guy's a human, after all, he's not just a name and a, and a, a terrorist or a prisoner. So I am grateful to all the support we got, and uh, it's part of the reason why I'm here. And uh, being back in Canada is just unbelievable. We, take, we do take our 
freedom for granted. We, you know, um, me and Marwa just walk the streets and we're just ecstatic. We do the mundane things. We're very easy to impress. We love life more than ever. We go into the movies like we're going to Paris. You know, let's go. It's 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 really interesting feeling. I. I, I'm not over it yet, and you know, even the food, you're like, yeah, we're having eggs with bacon, yes, you know, I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's been there for 40 years, <laughs> you know, so it's just awesome, and we're so inspired being in UBC because, I mean, we thought we were going to come and stay on campus for a week, and then we started looking in, uh, for flats downtown, and then we changed our mind, we said, you know, well, let's just stay here, there's so many great people here, every time I go out of my room, I'm meeting students and t teachers and you know, there's a lot of ideas flowing around, so it's a healthy, we love it here, the, I mean, the greenery is awesome as well, and the nature, and, you know, it's just beautiful, and um, uh, I'm watching the news in the Middle East right now, and it, it's, it's killing me, you know, it's just, I know, I see a lot of my friends reporting the news, and a lot of them, just two days ago, one was arrested, and they continue to go to jail, I mean, this is an unbelievable, um, campaign against journalism. It's, it's really worse than I've ever seen since I started my career in 2003. I mean, and, and it's not just in the Middle East, unfortunately. We saw what happened in Ferguson. I was watching it from prison. We saw what happened um, yesterday in, in Missouri. Um, and, we, and we're seeing it happen here in Canada on a much you know, calmer, there's no, you know, it's not as it's bad as some other places, but you know, C-51 is very questionable. And um, I can't pretend that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an expert on Canadian politics because I've been gone for a while, but I could, you know, I've learned throughout my career to read um, what's, and, and read people's reactions and try to understand what's happening. And I think uh, a lot of people are very hopeful with this new government. Um, from the time we got on the airplane, people were just hostesses. But even the police was so nice to me when I arrived. They were, I'm not used to that. And everybody's sharing, sharing their, their, their hopes and aspirations. And we're very excited to do more here with our foundation and to share our experiences to different classrooms. Because this case, indeed, it has issues related to geopolitics and freedom of expression. It has also issues to identity. You know, I... I had to drop my Egyptian nationality to benefit from this law, but then they didn't use the law to get me out, although the Canadian government and the Egyptian government told me, yeah, yeah, drop it, drop it, we'll get you out. Both governments. And it was the hardest thing to do. What do you mean you're taking nationality? What does that mean? Nationality I mean, is not a piece of paper. You know, it's, uh, it's the values. And, you know, the best part of, about the identity thing is that I was branded as an Egyptian of convenience and a Canadian of convenience. I'm like, guys, make up your mind. You know, and I, you know, and I, it's not that. It's not a piece of paper. You, I, I came to Canada. I, ca I live with the values, re the Constitution, and the values of what being Canadian is. And, uh, and I took that with me to the Middle East. And it helped me in my career and in maneuvering and in reporting the story, being grounded on both sides of the world. And, you know, it's, it's just uh, shocking how uh, sometimes it becomes a bit superficial. And, but there's always a way of dealing with it and trying to, you know, talk and write and use, you know, your channels of communication to clarify where you stand and uh, what you stand for. And I believe journalism is, uh, is extremely vital for us today, or else we would be in the dark. And I feel it now that I'm on this side of the world, and I'm following what's happening in the Middle East on a daily basis, and I have to jump on Twitter to see what's going on. And actually, Twitter, in terms of, how, again, how important social media is, in the past, when, as a journalist, the first thing in the morning I'd do is look at Reuters and Associated Press, because these are the wires, these are the you know, quick what's going on. But now, I don't even look at that. I look at Twitter, you know. And I look at, uh, because, and I follow specific people that I trust, you know, that I feel that are balanced and they're not biased in any way. But even during the revolution, in these very critical moments, you'd follow the, you know, the most accurate ISIS accounts <laughs> or the most, most accurate business uh, Muslim Brotherhood accounts to see, compare where the protests are moving from today, where are they starting, uh, the activists, you, you follow the accounts that you feel uh, resonate throughout time and make sense 
in terms of what, what they're saying. And after a while, government started doing the same thing. The Egyptian government decided to have a Twitter account, and the president started using it, and the ministers, and uh, everybody has a Twitter account. And they, they started even dis disseminating information through Twitter. And we, the journalists, started embedding tweets in our reports. You know? And so social media has become an integral part of journalism, and it has also become an integral part for advocacy, and uh, it's a double sword, of course, but we have to be able to uh, manage it, basically. Thank you.